hello everybody welcome to the afternoon session of the um, Wales's Global Solidarity Summit my name is Catherine Olongo I'm a development support my, um, officer for um, Re Africa uh, thank you for joining us after lunch um, I am pleased to uh, welcome Moki Makura from um, Africa No Filter. She's executive director and it's an absolute privilege to have her here today to talk to us about their work. Um, and also I'm uh, pleased to welcome Faith. Faith is um, working with us from um, the Sub-Saharan Advisory Panel. Many of you will be uh, familiar with her by now. Um, uh, a couple of housekeeping. Uh, this session, you've automatically been pulled into the session. When the session finishes, you'll automatically go back into the lounge area. Um, it's going to be an hour long. Uh, we'll finish at three o'clock and then we'll uh, have our World Cafe from 3.30 till 5. Um, this session here is uh, open to kind of conversation. We want you to use the chat if you need to discuss what is um just what, what we're talking about during the session, um, but also if you have specific questions, please can you use the Q&A symbol that's on the top right hand side um, and there you can enter your questions that we will highlight to ask Moki during um, that session. Um, this is a, a brave space. We uh, welcome challenge and um, conversation, but people's lived experience are not up for debate. Um, so we will we have a zero tolerance policy to any racism or any prejudice, and you will be removed. Okay, thank you very much. Over to you. Is over to me or to Faith? Over to you. <laughs> oh, okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, as I said, my name is Moki Makura, I'm Executive Director of African Earth Filter. And I'm going to start this session with two questions. The first question is, when I say Africa, when I say Somalia, Mali, Nigeria, Sudan, Angola, DRC, what are the words that come to your mind? Think about it. Serious question. And the second question is, Look at the words you've jotted down or you're thinking about and ask yourself what informs your perspectives on those countries? How do you get to those ideas on those countries? So I lead an organization called Africa No Filter, which was set up to shift harmful and stereotypical narratives about Africa. So we live and we breathe this every single day. And one of the first things we looked at when we started was research on narratives about Africa. And we went through nearly 60 documents, research reports, books, academic journals from the year 2000 to about now to find out what had been written on African narratives. And what we found was really interesting. There are five key frames through which most stories are told about Africa. And I'd actually like you to think about it and actually kind of think about when you read last saw a story about Africa, did it fit into one of these five frames? The five frames are this poverty, conflict, corruption, disease, poor leadership. Now, some people think narratives and stories are the same, but they're not. Narratives are a collection of stories told over time that come to represent a central belief or central idea. So when you look at the frames, we sort of identified these three beliefs or central ideas around Africa. That Africa is broken, that Africa is dependent and that Africans lack agency. And those three central ideas or central beliefs have become the narrative about Africa. And, you know, because I do this all day, a lot of people ask me, yeah, so, so what? what? Why does narrative matter? And I say narrative matters because it actually informs your belief system and your beliefs inform your behavior. Last year, in October 2021, the African Development Bank president, Aki Adishino, he addressed a group of African ambassadors in the US. And this is what he said in his speech, and I quote, a concerted effort to change the narrative on Africa in the US is necessary to attract increased investments into the continent. And I share that quote just to show you that narrative really has implications. It has implications on business and, and investment. 
It means that, you know, Britain, you know, England, Wales will continue to pour more development and philanthropic money into this continent rather than invest in it. Poor narratives scare investors. And Africa's political risk profile, for example, has been used by loads of investors to explain their lack of investment or, or the high cost of money when it comes to borrowing. Narrative has implications on aid policies and the development agenda. agenda. Um, some of you may remember at the beginning of the pandemic, narrative definitely informed Melinda Gates's comment about dead bodies in the streets in Africa at the start of COVID. It also informed Britain's refusal to accept vaccine certificates from Africa at one point. It's led to perceptions about the scale of migration, headlines like African migrants storm the border with Spain. The reality is Africans actually make up 14, 1-4% of all global migrants. 40% of them come from Asia and actually 24% of them come from Europe. Narrative has impact on creativity and innovation on the continent. And actually, for me personally, the worst thing about narrative is that it robs Africans. It robs us of the African dream. And it makes us feel a little bit less than. So I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about how we got here, where we are today, and what the future could look like. So how did we get here? There have been tons of iconic moments that have literally defined the continent for most of us. But for me personally, it was 1985. It was Live Aid and Michael Jackson's We Are The World. I was in my teens in 1985. I shouldn't actually be saying that um, when Live Aid happened. But the picture that really captured the world was the famous Kenyan photographer, Mo Amin, who became the defining moment that picture became the defining moment for a generation, me included. Africa was broken. It needed fixing. And its problems were so, so basic that anyone, anyone with a single pound or a euro to spare could actually help. And the picture was of starving children in Ethiopia. The pictures were about the Ethiopian famine. famine. So I watched the concert. I listened to the song. I even sang the song. <laughs> And I watched how the world reported on Africa. 21 years later, in the year 2000, many still quote that economist, uh, the economist's iconic um, headline, the hopeless continent, and that defined us for a while. And there have been many, many other articles that perpetuated that stereotype. Most recently, the Wall Street Journal declared military coups in Africa at the highest level since the end of colonialism. The headline, the article, the accompanying audio discussions prove that international media today are still taking a predominantly negative tone about Africa. At the same time of that Wall Street Journal article, there was a Financial Times article that declared failure of democracy. Why are coups on the rise in Africa? And I like this example because in both those stories, and those are sort of well-respected global you know, news outlets, what was missing in the story was context and actual data. Because in 2021, the year they were reporting on, there were four coups they were reporting on. But if there were four coups in Africa, there were 50 African countries that did not have coups. That's over 92% of the continent did not experience a coup. And the number of attempted and successful military coups in 2021 was actually five. And it was no higher than in previous years and had actually decreased over a period of time. That's not what that, um, either of those articles said. And when UK and US audiences were asked how they interpreted the headlines, a quarter of the people they spoke to assumed that the headline referred to there being more than 45 coups in Africa in 2021. And that's the power of framing. In 2019, we commissioned a report on how Africa shows up in the US. And we looked at 700,000 hours of news and entertainment. Well, we didn't. The research company we did, we hired did. It was actually the University of Southern California. They went, they went through all of that footage to look and see where Africa was covered. Half of all the mentions they found of Africa were in the news. So it was about politics and it was crime. And we know that news by definition is often negative 
it's hard news. So a lot of what Americans were seeing about Africa was negative. Mainstream shows, you know, on TV, like some of the series, they reference Africa, often really as a country, it was some random place, never really specific about where it was. And the storylines were always criminal. But we didn't just look at how Amer Africa showed up in America. We also showed up how, we also looked at how Africa showed up in Africa. So what was a Kenyan reading about a South African or a Nigerian seeing about a Ghanaian? And what we found was there was a dominance of global media when it comes to Africa stories. In fact, one third of all media coverage about Africa came from Western news sources. 81% of the stories were hard news. They were stories of conflict, post-election violence, humanitarian crises. And a lot, most of the coverage about um, Africa actually was, was politics and elections. I mean, in 2021, there were 13 elections in Africa, and that is 13 reasons to cover the continent in a negative way. So even if you didn't read the news and you try to look at alternative sources of information in Africa, they're actually limited. I mean, less than 3% of the English continent content on Wikipedia is about Africa, less than 3%, which means there is more about Africa. So there's more about Paris on Wikipedia than there is about the whole of Africa. And I'm going to repeat that. There is more about Paris on, the, on Wikipedia than there is about the whole of Africa. And less than 1% of that continent content comes from Africans as it is written by us. So that's another issue. The problem is that most people haven't actually been to Africa. So they do rely on media, on films, on social media, on pop culture, on fundraising adverts from charities in the UK to tell them what Africa is like. And sadly, a lot of people in the development space working on African issues have never been to the communities they want to help. And in the sort of times when they do come, they stay in five-star hotels and they eat at five-star restaurants, but they don't mention that when they get back because it's not a convenient story to share. So the inconvenient truth about Africa is that Africa is not a single story of poverty, of corruption, of conflict, poor leadership and disease. It is 54 different countries with good and bad. And people working to save Africa often forget that. But I am going to say it is not all doom and gloom. So where are we today? There is progress. Music and creatives are doing a lot to change stereotypes. I mean, I loved it when Burner Boy won Best Global Album in March last year, and he was featured on the cover of GQ Britain. And when he won, he said, Africa is in the house. Because all of a sudden, Africa was cool. Well, not all of a sudden, Africa was cool. When it comes to music, Afrobeats, Africa is cool. But in a way, to a certain extent, that feeds the stereotype that, Af that Africans are all about music. We're not about serious things like business and developing our own countries. But we're increasingly seeing more stories about business in Africa, about entrepreneurs, about innovation. But we've just done a study about that. And we've looked and we've seen that a lot of those stories on business in Africa are actually written through the lens of China or US or, or UK, almost as if we can't have business without one of the big global giants involved. And I think the big thing is there are much, much, there, there, sorry, not much, there are many, many more people defending the continent of Africa and shouting up and putting their hands up when they see things like Africa No Filter. So what could the future look like and how do we fix things? And I think there are really three things we can do to fix some of the issues that I've talked about. And one is more nuanced reporting from the media. And because a lot of times when I talk about negative narratives, people always think, oh, do you want to be this PR campaign for Africa? You only want to talk about the good news. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about nuanced reporting. Um, and we've just launched the Global Media Index, the Index for Africa, which actually will look at global media outlets coverage of Africa. And we're really using it as a carrot rather than the stick approach to show what's good about reporting. And there's an organization, the New Humanitarian, that's actually trying to do this work. They're, they're calling it decolonizing the newsroom. And a simple example of when you talk about corruption in Nigeria, 
put it into context because the whole country is not corrupt and it's about contextualizing it's about nuanced reporting it's about you know saying that when you went to your poor community you actually did stop at the hilton um you know or the radisson you know it, it, it's not just about the one side and that's what we're trying to to prove so if we can get more stories that sort of talk about nuanced aspects of the continent the countries they cover we're one step closer the second thing we can do is look for more and different stories about Africa across the board, from our films to our plays, to the podcasts we listen to, the social media we hear. Because I think pop culture is the most powerful way of influencing people and shaping opinion. And when I think about how I figured out America was a superpower, it wasn't because I read the, you know, the defense you know, the handbook, it was because I watched their movies. So there is a real role for us to kind of see more nuanced and just storytelling with different alternative perspectives coming out um, of Africa. And the third thing I would say in the way of changing some of the issues that I've talked about is that there are more stories. We need more stories that center African voices and really adopt this whole ethical storytelling practice, especially in the development sector. Um, and I'll just speak here a little bit about the Ethical Storytelling Handbook, which African Earth Filter published. And, it, you know, it's, essentially it's a really, really simple guide. And it's supposed to help you fix some of the unintended consequences. Because I do want to be clear that a lot of the implications of the kind of storytelling we see is unintended. Um, and we, we, we actually in the book show what good and bad looks like through case studies. So it starts off with a couple of states, case studies. And then in just eight steps... We share how storytellers can literally flip the script on the stereotypical narrative. And it involves things like understanding your privilege and checking it. You know, if you're working in a country like, you know, the UK or you're working in Wales, chances are you're of a different level. You've probably got more income, but you're helping people who are probably, in your opinion, very poor. But once you understand that you do not have their lived experience and you have a very different frame of reference, it also should inform how you start engaging. It, so, And that's why I mean that you just need to understand your privilege and just check your privilege and know that you don't know necessarily what's best for them. You have a different frame. And it's really about being respectful and not quite so extractive. You know, you don't come in, get your story and go out. It's about developing a relationship with the community you're actually trying to help. It's about co-creating stories rather than just determining, sitting somewhere in Wales, what story needs to be told. You have to send people out there to get it because the chances are you will get that story. There have been many examples that show that, you know, you come with your camera, you ask in the community, oh, we want to talk to women who have been raped. And this was a real case, women who've been raped. And they were paying a little bit of money to come, you know, get people to talk. People in the community all came up. All the women mysteriously had been raped, not because they were. Was That's because they were going to get money from telling their story. And there's tons of examples like that. So be careful what you look for and be careful what you ask for, because you'll probably get it. But it's not authentic. Also, things like checking for bias. You know, for example, in the team, who are you hiring? Are you hiring the photographer that you really like working with because he, you know, he speaks, you know, Welsh and, you know, you just like him? And I have to confess, I once, because I used to work um, in, for a foundation in the space, I once flew in a photographer from Australia, listen to this, for a shoot in Africa. It's a long story, but and I couldn't do anything about it, but it was the people I worked with, they thought that was the best photographer. Um, and it was it was ridiculous. Um, it's also about things like gaining meaningful consent, even after the um, you know, even after the story or the film has been produced. Um, I once worked on a project where I had um, developed some HIV films and we were we had promised we were going to show it on social media. And I partnered with the um you know, Ministry of Health in, in the country where I was at. And they'd um, not really engaged. They hadn't given us any feedback. And then one day, all of a sudden, I got a WhatsApp saying that those films are being shown in the local clinic. And I was like, well, how would they get there? And, you know, the government partner had just taken this unfinished product, hadn't even told me, and was showing the films in all the primary healthcare clinics in the province in which we were. And that person's story who we'd featured was 
was broadcast to the community where he lived and he was gay and the community were not happy about that. And apparently he got death threat. And that's what I mean, that meaningful content, consent isn't just when you walk away. It's actually all the way through to where is that film going to be shown? And it's about understanding local context, putting things in time and employing locals as part of the whole sort of story generation process, not a bunch of, you know, foreigners flying in, go, you know, getting the story and leaving. And really, I guess at the end of the day, the, you know, the handbook is supposed to be an intervention. It's supposed to be an intervention to help storytellers reconsider how they conceptualize stories, how you gather material, and actually how you edit the final product. And I really want to just end, you know, with a question really, again, that, you know, when people are thinking about showcasing their work for whatever reason, you know, fundraising, reporting to your, your funders for, you know, just sharing your work, I would love you to think about what narrative am I um, feeding and what is my story serving? And I'm going to end there and I'm going to hand back to, I guess, Faith. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much, Ricky. We really appreciate that talk. It was very interesting and succinct and so many great points were covered. So um, thank you for that. Um, we are now going to move on to a Q&A part of the session. So I'm going to start off with some questions of my own before then opening up the floor to questions from our audience. So uh, my first question is, where is the best place for small organisations who want to tell more ethical stories to start? Okay, that's an easy one. They need to go to www.africanofilter.com, sorry, .org, and download our ethical storytelling handbook because it really is a practical guide. It really is. And, you know, we've actually had a larger organization ask if we want to do a workshop on it. And I said, to be honest, if you just took as many of those sort of eight steps and tried to apply them, you don't need a workshop because we've tried to simplify it. Um, and that's what I would suggest um, as one of the ways. And just very quickly, the reason why we did it is that there's a lot of content, a lot of writing on ethical storytelling, a lot of academic stuff on what's right. And what we felt was lacking was how do you actually apply it? And that's what that book right. has done. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for that. I can see that Kath has put a link to that in the chat. So um, if anybody would like to read the handbook, please do. The link is there. And secondly, um, what advice do you have for individuals who are trying to ensure ethical storytelling, but are facing pushback um, from colleagues or maybe even higher ups? Well, I think, you know, a couple of things. I'd, I'd want to understand what the reasons are. And I think, you know, where, where there's any sort of um, issue with people not agreeing on anything, it's about understanding what are the real issues they're objecting to. Because I find it difficult to believe that anybody would actually object to the principles of ethical storytelling, which are about respect, about community, about sort of giving other people the platform, about giving pe Africans whose stories you're telling their voices. I, I feel there are very few people, I might be wrong, who would actually object to that. So my question would be, what are the things that they're objecting to? Is it the cost? Is it, you know, the fact that, um, you know, it takes longer to do ethical storytelling properly? Is it because you want to work with specific, you know, partners? I mean, it could even be that, you know, you need to go in and get that story that looks exactly like that because you want to, you know, share it with your funder, you know, funders because you need more money. Um, and, you know, in that case, I would say to those people that, you know, there are studies that have been done that show people are tired of seeing the same old images of Africa. It shows that the money you've put in today as an organization has done nothing because it never shows progress. It never shows hope. And people are actually, quite frankly, a little bit tired about that. So, you know, if it is a fundraising issue, people want to see pictures of hope, not of 
poverty and you know and despair and I think there are ways of getting your story and again it's about contextualizing it you don't go in and just show that poor community where have people who've come out of that community gone to you know if we fix this community where does it lead to you know Mm -hmm. so I think there are ways of telling the story um and you know and pushing back to people who are stuck in a very particular type of mindset Mm. about how they want to see Africa. And it goes to that point I made about sometimes there's an inconvenient truth to Africa that doesn't serve their purpose. So they shut it down. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think you are um, very, very correct. It's always underlying issues, you know. Um, And for my final question, um, I was thinking of myself as being part of the diaspora, but I do believe this applies to anyone. Um, Mm -hmm. How can we uh, advocate for African partners or individuals when we see storytelling or even just interactions which aren't quite right, but that partner, that African partner or individual has not raised this as an issue themselves? Um, You know, I I mean, look, I I think personally that there are lots of cases where we where you see where people are either intimidated, a bit scared, you know, you know, if you're in a community and, you know, a bunch of white people come in, you know, you're going to kind of bow your head and do what they want. But I, I do think that, you know, there are two things. We must encourage people to and give them the space to do what they need to do to to speak out, because often there isn't space. Sorry, somebody's fixing something behind me. It's actually distracting me a little bit. Um, But yeah, you need to give people the space and give people the permission to speak out because that is something I think that's important. So, you know, if you're in a room, in a meeting and everyone's quiet, maybe you need to say, you know, this is a space where people can speak out, where you can say what, you know, what you feel. If you feel that you, you know, you haven't had a chance to speak, then say That's one thing. I personally don't really like the idea of people speaking for other people because it's feed that narrative about us not having agency. We can't do it ourselves. So I, my preference is to open up the space to encourage me to do that. And, and I'll just tell you quickly how that has worked in a gender space. I mean, I've been in meetings where, you know, you normally sort of, you know, just ask, throw a question out. And usually it's the men, you know, that would answer and the women often didn't speak. And in this particular environment, I saw how the male moderator actually stopped and he called on women and he said, Faith, do you have anything to say? Moki, do you have anything to say to encourage us to speak? Um, And I thought that was excellent because, you know, Faith may not have spoken because, you know, somebody puts up their hand and she's a bit shy. But when she was called on, she was invited and made clear that the space was a safe space. It worked. I think that's the way we should we should um, tackle that issue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. It is so important to ensure that there is space for everyone and all the various stories out there. So thank you. Um, I'm going to now open it up to some of the questions that we've been receiving in the Q&A chat. Please do use this function um, as we have some time now uh, to ask Moki some of these questions. Um, So I'm just going to start from the top which has now moved but I can see a question oh which says uh where should we be looking to find stories about Africa told by Africans which will give us a fresh perspective and which we can share that is such a great question because I have exactly the right answer for that um Africa the has actually created um a story agency called bird and if you want to follow it it's bird bird story agency on twitter i know it's also on instagram but it's exactly for that reason because where do you find stories that present an alternative perspective about africa and these are more sort of human interest stories data driven stories um and and what you know what two of the stories that i found that were really interesting and it was data that's there that was available but no one was looking for a good news story out of africa we found out we put out stories that said, you know, that Africa is the largest exporter of citrus fruit in the world. You know, as you're eating your orange, think about that, um, you know, in the UK. And also the fact that the the other piece of data that was interesting, that the most, um, uh, I don't know how to say this one, but the most um, cryptocurrency um, trades or exchanges was done in Kenya. You know, Kenyans were far ahead in cri- cryptocurrency than they were in any world. They were actually using it to trade transactions. So those are kind of things that Bird has been digging out. And also we just get, you know, um, 
you know, journalists from across Africa who want to write because often they say, look, our editors don't want these stories. There's nowhere to place them. We take stories. We pay journalists. So if you're a journalist, you've got a great, you know, I don't want to say positive story um, because it sort of seems like it belittles it a little bit. They're just stories that show this alternative perspective. They're, you know, stories of entrepreneurship, of, you know, women doing amazing things, of, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the, thank you for that question. It's great. Look at Bird. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think we'll probably have a link to Bird in the chat function. So um, please do go and look at it. I had a look myself and I was like, where has this been? It's what I've been waiting for. Um, so I'm going to now go on to the next question, um, which says enabling people to tell their authentic stories takes trust and therefore time. How do we advocate to donors that this is more important than a quick story? Mm. So I guess kind of uh, similar to what you've said earlier and the question I've asked, but yeah, specifically mm. with donors. Yeah, I mean, look, I think there are a couple of things here. I, I, I feel that, you know, sometimes we, we assume that, you know, doing proper storytelling will always take longer. Um, it might take longer because it's the first time you've done it differently, but there's no reason why if you've got a great funder, you have people in the community, you go in there and you you, you don't come with the agenda, you can still get your story, you know, your, your quick story. But again, I would ask your funders, what are they looking to achieve? Because the reason why often you were telling stories is because you're showcasing your work, you're trying to raise funding, you know, all of these things. And isn't it better to showcase your work in a context that shows respect, that shows progress, that, you know, centers the voices of the very people that you're helping? And it, it goes to the core of development now. It's not just about storytelling. It's actually the way development is shifting and changing where you know it's unrestricted funding for example is becoming a thing where you know it's solutions and problems are not identified somewhere in wales um and then they're implemented by a partner you know somewhere in africa um and no one has ever actually spoken to the community whether or not they want this or whether or not you know mm -hmm. it's the thing for them and i think it's about retraining people's minds. And I don't know that it's the responsibility of the storytellers to do that. It's an organizational mind shift that's actually needed. And, and I will just tell you the, the way I sort of explain it is if you came to my home, right? And you sat down and said, hmm, Moki, yes, I think you need a new roof. And I'm going to get you a roof. And you go out and you bring some builders in and you knock my old roof down, you put a new roof down. If you'd asked me, and I've told you, my children have not been to school, we have not eaten for two days. And if I had money right now, the last thing I would do was put a roof up. So if you want to really help me, mm -hmm. you've got to understand what my priorities are. Because when you, when you go, I will take that roof down and I will sell every single piece of it to buy the food that I need for my children. Mm -hmm. And that's the approach with development right now. And it is changing. It is changing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your answer, I think that's, yeah, very true and important. Um, I can see another question here, um, which says, a campaign launched yesterday in the UK, which centered white people as helpers. It has been justified as appealing to audiences that have otherwise disengaged with aid work. How do we challenge this narrative that pity is worth the return? Um, like I said, I think that that's very antiquated, and I think story studies have shown that actually, you know, that white savior com complex, it's not necessarily what people want to see. But people do it because they don't know any better. And I think sometimes it's about reflecting and telling people what is wrong with what they're doing. And I'll use the example of Black Lives Matter. Racism has always been there, but all of a sudden, because Black Lives Matter opened up the space for people to be able to talk about it and say, no, actually that's racist and you know that's white privilege. It wasn't a conversation that people were having before. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's the same right now. You know, When you see things like that, we need to say something. And I often say, if you see something, say something. Literally, if that campaign, if it, if it centered pe white people as the helpers, that is an old fashioned narrative. It's feeding and a stereotype it's feeding. And any organization that's still doing that needs to kind of rethink the way it tells its story and the way it positions itself because it's going to pretty soon get left behind 
but we need to tell them people need to say something so tell me who <laughs> tell me the organization put it in the, and i will say something thank you thank you for that and thank you for the offer as well um much appreciated i'm just going to double check that i haven't missed any questions um before moving on because i can see some and uh oh a question has just appeared um so there have been some improvements in narratives but when there is a humanitarian crisis there is a return to the pictures of starvation and suffering when's the balance between showing real crisis and reinforcing stereotypes yeah, and I think that this is an important question because, and this is something I hope I alluded to, is that it's not about whitewashing and saying that actually there's no, you know, there isn't a drought, you know, that these things aren't happening. It's about the nuance and how you tell the story. So you're going into Ethiopia, you know, at the time in 1985, there was a drought and it wasn't the single story of Ethiopia. And if you go to Ethiopia now, they had a, a drought um, not that many years ago and it was covered very differently. Um, and I think it's it's how you balance the storytelling. Um, and unfortunately, because of the news cycle and the way global news works and they have a split second to tell you everything about you know the country and the one thing they tell you is that they're starving, um, there are millions of starving people, then it, it there's a lot that needs to change about the system, the entire system. But mm. I still think that we can do more to make sure the story is nuanced. For example, the, the famine is only happening in this northern part of the country. Because believe me, you're there filming, you're staying in a hotel, a five-star hotel in the, in the capital, right? You've driven there with your cameras. So there is a way of telling more balanced, nuanced stories that the whole country, and I don't know, if, you know, I've sat in Nigeria when I don't know what was happening and I was watching CNN. And I was like, oh my God, are we okay? And yes, of course I was because, yeah. you know, it was, it, what was happening was in a small part of the country. In fact, Boko Haram, for example, was happening in a small part of the country. And I don't want it to belittle the importance of the Boko Haram story or saying that it's not relevant, but the bulk of Nigerians get on with work every day. They do the same things that people in Wales are doing. We get up, we go to work, we want to do well for our kids, we want to educate our kids. It's the same things that drive us. We are not the story of poverty and conflict. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, thank you so much. I don't believe there are any new questions. So I'm going to invite Kath back onto the stage to tell us more about the sessions that are coming up this afternoon. Sorry, I was muted enough. Um, yeah, thanks for that both, thank you. Um, there was one more question in the chat, I think that came up. So the, the last point, talking about humanitarian crises, I mean, for me, um, uh, you know, I have family in the South Pacific and uh, I've worked in the South Pacific and the current affairs with the stories that are coming out of Tonga and the way that that is being depicted, I find it really different at the moment. And I think that possibly one of the things that's impacting that is that, um, external aid agencies aren't able to go in because of COVID and not wanting to, you know, add to that stress. But it, it mm -hmm. means that the images that are coming out and the stories that are coming out and the work is being done by Tongans. Um, and I and I think that does show that it can effectively communicate what is happening right. Right. without, a, 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 you know, a different lens. Mm -hmm. uh, people are telling the stories of their own communities. Right. And, and, right. I, and I think that's... I mean, there is a there is a whole sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say I know there's a whole move and a trend towards like, do we still need international correspondence? Do we still need people to fly in and and tell mm. the story for us? And that's a real debate that's going on now because mm. I don't think so. Mm. Mm. And it and it shows from what's happening now. Mm. Um, I think there was a question from Leone. Um, bear with me one second. Uh, Leona, you asked, um, how do we tell the hard stories in a way that empowers, for example, action on climate change? In a way that empowers the, the, the people in the story. I'm assuming, Leona, that's 
what you mean from that. Mm. Let's mm. go with that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, look again. It goes back to the things that we we said. I think there are two really important things for me. One is who is telling the story. Are you telling my story for me, or are you letting me speak for myself? Because how I frame it is differently. It's very different. Um, and also, you know, is the story you're telling my story, or are you telling me? to tell the story for you. Again, to that example, you know, if you come in and you, you know, give me money and yeah, you want a story about women who've been raped in my community, I will give you that story. You know, so a lot of it depends on, you know, what is, and actually going back to the climate change um, example, we did, um, so we looked at sort of how Africa sort of came across in this whole um, climate change thing. And, you know, I think a BBC headline summed it up. It said something like Africa is sleepwalking towards, a, you know, climate catastrophe as if we weren't even, we didn't notice it. The thing is yeah. the way the conversation was being had in global markets, it wasn't how climate change conversations were being had in in a lot of African countries. So if you looked at Nigeria, there were these Fulani herdsmen, you know, um, there were nomadic tribe that were going and they were killing local farmers. And at first it was seen as a story of insecurity and, you know, farmers were being killed. But over time, people realized actually it was a climate story because those nomadic um, herdsmen were moving because they had they had to move their cattle far more frequently. There was nothing for their cattle to eat. So it actually was a climate change story. And that's how climate change became important and relevant in Nigeria. Same with Kenya, same with um, Madagascar. <coughs> sorry, sorry. So yeah, it's about what's relevant rather than what's the conversation you want to have. Thank you. So I've just seen there are also more questions. Um, apologies to all of you. Uh, my Wi-Fi has not been the best, um, but they have loaded. So um, if it's okay, can we, we can take them? Yeah, right. go ahead, go ahead. Um, so I can see, I'm just going to put it on the stage for all of us. Um, thank you again, um, Moki, for your presentation. Uh, when you talk of negative reporting by international media, how do you consider the way African leaders have compromised the functioning of state institutions? Uh, media reports it it does not create news sorry i can only see half the question so how do so can you just read the second half how do you consider the way african leaders i can't see the question so okay oh sorry um I can see so, half of it. so it says when uh, you speak of negative reporting by international media how do you also consider the way african leaders have compromised uh, the functioning of state institutions. I'm assuming they also mean um, like freedom of press and the media in those African countries as well. Right. Um, I believe that's what they're trying to say. Please, um, if you want yeah. to add another bit, you can. Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, I would just challenge the statement about, you know, how African leaders, how many African leaders, which countries have state institutions been, been you know, compromised? I mean, I sit in South Africa. I think our state institutions are working very well, very powerful sort of um, justice system. Um, you know, each country is different. So I, I want to know where, where we say we compromise state institutions. But you know, there are a lot of countries in Africa that are de democratic now. So, you know, you vote for what you get. But in order for me to answer that, I'd need to know exactly what they were referring to. Because, again, it's those kind of generalizations, um, like the coup story that I, I um, the coup case study that I mentioned, that sort of, you know, paint the whole continent with one brush. And we're trying to avoid that. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for that. It's, yes, so needed to have just more 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 nuance more stories um and there is another question which i will bring up for us um oh, okay this seems to be more of a statement which i read out anyway um i like the parallels between community development best practice in wells and the approach that we need to take working in Africa, i.e. in partnership with local people and directed by the local grassroots. So right. um, I'm gonna pass on thanks from Steve. Um, I thought I saw another question. Uh, oh, so yes. And this says, so how can uh, Yongo bring his story of climate emergency? 
in his community to a wider audience to generate action and effective support. He's younger. I wasn't sure. But I mean, if it means like, how can a local climate activist sort of bring his story, um, you know, to a wider community? Look, I think people forget that social media has democratized access, you know, so we may not necessarily be in the global conversations, but you know, people locally have followings. There's a whole, you know, you know, there's even there's black Twitter. <laughs> you know, there there are conversations within conversations. So I think the assumption that you know this person has no agency to you know find his tribe or to speak to his community, I think is is an assumption. And I don't know who Yongo is, so unfortunately, I can't really. I've just that. seen um, Yongo is a participant. Um, in this conference and has oh, okay. been telling his story today in the chat boxes. Okay. Apologies, Yongo, where I have to flip between the Q&A box. Um, I can't actually see the chat box um, as it's happening. Um, but I will... Okay, it is moving quite fast. Everybody is talking, which we love to see. Um, but please... Do you expand on your question? Um, yeah, I mean, look, there's, there's, we actually did a found, try to find a list of um, African climate change activists. We didn't find an awful lot. Um, and again, that was one of the, the issues that climate is not resonating the way, you know, then it, there's not one global conversation the way it's happening, you know, in, in the UK. Um, but I do think when you localize the issue and Yongo should be talking, I don't know where, which country he's from, um, he should be talking about the climate implication Kenya. in his country, Kenya, to um, Ke there's a lot of climate activity actually in, in Kenya. Um, and what we found actually is that, you know, people like um, Vanessa N Niketa, who's a Ugandan um, climate change activist, known globally, very little activity in her own country, Uganda. So what we need to be careful of is, is getting these spokespeople and putting them on a global platform and they're not even resonating in their own countries because the change that is needed is at their country level. Thank you. Thank you for that. That is uh, very important. And something that I think as those of us in the diaspora do have to think about, you know, when you are uh, in one place and perhaps you haven't been in 10 years and you still have, you know, a view that may not necessarily be still correct or still current. It is definitely something that I think we have to be especially mindful of. Right. And um, so I, I really agree. Um, I'm just going to double check or even triple check now um, that I have not missed any questions. Um, please, Kath, have a look for me if I have, um, if I have missed anything due to this Wi-Fi, I'm not trusting it. <laughs> I think we're, I think you're on top of it now, Faith. I think Amazing. That, that covers all the questions. Somebody has put up their hand. Um, if you have put up your hand, I'm sorry, we, um, if, if you put your question into the chat, then we'll be able to see it. Um, so we've got 10 minutes left, Faith. Do you mind if I just talk about the next session before, uh, before we close? Is that all right? Please. Um, so we have something called the World Cafe that is happening next. Um, this is going to be from 3.30 until 5. And we've got members of the Wales Africa community, both based in sub-Saharan Africa and in Wales. And I think a couple of people from England as well uh, will be hosting rooms where um, you can go and listen to um, the discussion on, on various topics. So once this session closes, you'll be able to see lots of different tables. And those tables... Um, have headings and you can go into them for 20 minutes and what will happen is after 20 minutes they will stop speaking and you'll be invited to go into a different room so you have three um three 20 minute sessions where you'll be able to look at uh you'll be able to drop in and and discuss various issues uh one of the tables that's going to be in that is going to be um uh, Faith is going to be talking about Africa No Filters Resource. They've got a handbook, which uh, we've shared with you today. Um, and I have just dropped the link and it's how to tell, how to tell an African story, it's eight steps. Um, do you mind explaining to us really quickly about that resource, where it came from and how you developed it so that people have an idea of um, 
what they're coming into when they join the the session afterwards. Right. Well, the ethical um, storytelling handbook came about because we realized that one of the dark areas of narrative change that we needed to shine a spotlight on was actually how stories are told about um, Africa from the development sector. Um, and we, that's when I, I said earlier on about the fact that we'd done a lot of, um, we'd found a lot of content, a lot of quite dry academic stuff that talked about ethical storytelling as a practice and as a philosophy. And what we felt was lacking was how do you actually apply it to the job that I do? You know, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, head of communications for UKA. How do I actually go about telling an ethical story? So we kind of broke it down into really easy steps um, to, you know, for communicators to follow. So if you are, you know, either a comms person or even if you are, you know, the actual photographer or the, you know, the person with the camera or the producer, you know, that every aspect of any kind of story gathering role, that handbook is actually relevant. It's really simple. It gives a couple of, of case studies to show you what is good storytelling. So there's a couple of names of you know, organizations there who, you know, done, have given us examples of you know how not <laughs> to tell an ethical story um and um there's some good ones as well so you know th the point is that it's practical and if you follow some of these things um and maybe not all of them at the same time especially where you need to have a sort of organizational mind sh mind um shift within the, the the organization you work for it starts slowly um you know you don't change you didn't, we didn't stop racism overnight we're not going to do that we're not going to stop overnight you know how people report and talk about africa but it's one step at a time and i think awareness and reflecting things back at people to realize that no it's not okay is really a start and that's what the handbook does thank you thank you um okay uh, well, I was just, I was going to add to that. I mean, we've been working on it for, for a while in terms of looking at the Reframing the Narrative project. And um, I think uh, a piece of advice that I got that, that, that resonated with me personally was um, how would I feel if the person in the story was my sister or my mother or my daughter? Um, and I think uh, that for me would be just, you know, small nugget of okay so what lens am I looking at when I'm thinking about the story do either of you two have your kind of key little nug I'm putting you on the spot sorry but you know like your nuggets of like if there's one thing to think about think about this Faith I'll let you go first lovely lovely of course um I think it's at the crux of it I would think just being respectful just being decent just respecting that person enough to not show the most negative part of somebody's life because mm -hmm. that's not their entire life mm -hmm. and nobody would want that you know nobody wants their darkest day to be shown every day right. for the rest of like 20 30 years you know so I think it's just respect respect for the individual respect for the people and mm -hmm. um, respect for the story itself yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with that. And I, I've said my example already. It's like if you go to somebody's home, you go into their home, how would you behave? You don't stomp in there and tell them what you need to do. And I, hey, you do this. You don't. You have respect. And that's actually what it is. It, it, it's, it's respect. If you come, come at it, that's the single thing that always goes through my head. Like, you know, show respect. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Faith. Thank you very much, Moki. Thank you for um, taking, giving us your time and um, yeah, for sharing your expertise with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, there is, I don't know if you can see it, but there's lots of round of applause <laughs> coming up. There's a lot of love coming through. Uh, thank so, you uh, very much. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Uh, for anybody watching, there are lots of links that have gone into the chat. We'll try to pull it all together for the post event information, but um, have a look at it um, in this chat as it goes. And uh, remember that if you want to talk about the resource, join Faith at table nine uh, at the um, uh, World's Cafe in half an hour. Fab. Thank you very much, both. Thanks Thank you all. very much. Bye. Bye.